Welcome to the Parts Girl Podcast, powered by Parts Edge. We are excited to present our Fixed Operations Summer Camp Series. Your host, Kaylee Filio, will be joined by industry experts to discuss parts inventory control, special orders, lost sales, manufacturer programs, customer retention, and technicians. You're going to get it all in this special series. Welcome to the Parts Girl Podcast. I'm really excited about the summer camp series because I have Eric with me. We're going to talk about just performing with the end in mind as service advisors, training. We're going to talk about Google reviews. So Eric, just real quick, introduce yourself, where you're from, who you are. Oh, thank you, Kaylee, for having me. My name is Eric Howdy. I am a fixed operations trainer for Apple Holdings Company. I am new to the position in the training world, but I've been in the fixed operations world for over 20 years. Very excited and passionate about training fixed operations department. Yeah. So how long have you been in this new role? I've been in the new role now, moving on to two months now. Wow. Very good. And then you guys also, you and Joe also have a show, right? That you guys meet every Sunday. You would shout out the show. (laughs) Thank you. We have a fixed op. Something that I do on the side again, it's my passion. It's my hobby. It's a fixed operations community, which everybody comes together every single Sunday and we pick a topic and we talk about it. We take a deep dive into the realness of the situations that people are living in stores. Yeah. And it's called Service Drive Live. And I think that's what I love most about what you guys do is it's organized in the fact that you have a topic every week and you're not just meeting and kind of like BSing. It's like you're actually, you know, have something to talk about every week. So. No, it's it's yeah. very goal oriented. When we first set out to do this, um, it's very important for us to have a goal and to try to come up with solutions. There might not be one ultimate solution, which I never think there is, but there's multiple solutions out there to best fit whatever you feel works for you. Yeah, definitely. It's been a great growing community. Okay, let's get started. So when we talked about this, you wanted to talk about performing with the end in mind. What does that really mean? And can you just explain the concept so that everyone kind of understands? Yeah, it's it's something that I've been working with a very long time. When you have a, let's use a customer experience in mind, you have to imagine delivering that vehicle with a smiling face, a thank you, and a form of retention. How is that customer going to come back to you? Most people will say, Well, you start off with the welcoming. I personally, I like to start with the retention portion, and then I work my way back into the current time. That means I have to make sure the vehicle is washed, prepared, and staged properly. That means I have to make sure that the updates were taken care of, that the repairs or the maintenance was confirmed. How do I want that visit to go? And I do that with every customer that comes in now i'm doing that as i'm training i stole that idea let's call it what it is and i was i I was listening to interviews from very famous sports players and they always talk about when they walk out onto the field and it's it's their time to perform they never envision failing or if the play is going to be complete they envision completing the play they envision making that last second shot and winning the game So when when you walk out to a customer, it's really important to envision and making sure this customer is going to leave this store happy and this customer is going to come back. And when you put that mindset on, it's very, very powerful on how you actually control the experience. Mm -hmm. Well, and it's almost like you're, I feel like you're kind of training in a way to like put yourself into their shoes and how you want to be treated it's kind of so sounds so simple but it's like how would you want your experience to be and you're training people to do that and essentially kind of have some empathy right in performing with retention in mind too advisors managers they have to think on their feet at every given point because that vehicle that's coming in you don't know what the purpose or the emotions are inside of that vehicle You can have the customer who's coming in, who's got a check engine line on their brand new vehicle. You can have a mother who's coming in with, you know, 
children coming off of their car and she's focused on making sure they're transferred onto the next vehicle safely. You could be focused on the person who's coming in who says, I only have so much money to spend. So finding out what's important for that customer and being able to complete the experience with a positive outcome is very important. So when you're met with that, you automatically have to think, okay, this is how I want this to go. And then work your way back into it to make sure you have, you're almost setting up a map of the experience for that customer. Yeah. And so are there any strategies or things that if advisors are listening can take from this to be able to think a little bit more on their feet and kind of react to certain things that come up because you, you, you don't really know what's going on in someone's life for a day until they're kind of there. And even then you still kind of don't know unless they actually tell you. <laughs> so we do have many type of training formats for this, but to quickly just touch on some of them, one of the things that you have to be able to train and build is confidence. Then behind that, you also have to have empathy. So those are, those are skill sets that are arguable. Yes, they are trainable or not. You can't build on them, but I believe you can. I I believe you can train confidence. I believe you can train empathy, but it's a skill set that you have to build. It's something that you have to practice every day, which as advisors, we have that opportunity. But when, as you're, as you're coming out as an advisor, you have to have an open mind of what's coming and then you have to look for key points. And I, I use in a training, you know, emotion versus solution is not to get involved with the emotion of the situation, but have solutions prepared so that you can offer that to your client. I do agree. And that is kind of controversial as some people, I think why it's controversial is that empathy and confidence can kind of seem a little bit more natural to some people, whereas it is something that it does take practice and and training to really, I guess, hone in your own technique of empathy and confidence that you have as a person. So, and that's what you focus on training, right? Is yeah. We train with that, but you you have to, what I do is I show the result of it first. There's the benefit to it here. If here's a result and the benefit of this action, now let's train on the action so that we could get to this benefit and the result. Again, it's with the end in mind. So I show the ending first. And then I say, okay, if you want this ending, we have to train up to get to here. Because if you start working on the process automatically and somebody doesn't know where it's gonna get them to, uh, you, you kind of lose some of that concentration along the way. That makes sense. It's almost like explaining the why of like, I mean, right? Isn't that what that's it is? Exactly, <laughs> that's exactly that's exactly it. I, I tell people it's like ruining a good movie. It's telling the ending of the movie first. But you want to know why we're headed in this direction. And I'm saying it as you're saying it. It's knowing the why of it. So what can what can service managers do with with their advisors to, I guess, be more effective in communicating and supporting their advisors with this type of style. Cause I think what, you know, it's an ongoing thing. It's not something that you can just, you know, say, here you go, you've been trained. <laughs> so there's a couple of different areas. Number one is identifying that your team needs training. Too many times we're in the emotions of the day and we don't identify on time that our teams require training. What are some, um, every, are some red flags before we go into um, that? Your, your metrics will tell you. That should that should be your number one thing. Your reports and your metrics will tell you. Um, if you see if you see consistency in numbers without any small without there are advisors that are great advisors out there. There's a lot of them, but you have to make sure that you are keeping them up to task. You have to continue to train them. You have to make sure that you are, it's like shooting free throws. Uh, I'm going to go back to sports, but in order for you to continue to be a good free throw show, you have to continue to practice throw them or shoot them. The second thing that you have to make sure you identify with your team is, are you the person that should train them or not? Mm. And it's something that you have to test out. Sometimes as leaders, I've met with managers at this point where they say, look, I am not a trainer. I know how to manage but I need somebody to train our staff. To me, that's mind blowing. The fact that you're able to say, look, I'm not a trainer, I'm a manager, I'm a director, but I need somebody to come in and train our staff because there's there's different skill sets for it. It was an eye opener for me to see people have that vision. It's it's nice. Yeah. I'm, you're pointing that out and it made me think of, I, cause you know, we both have kids, right? So Mm -hmm. you think about 
kids and how they're so great with other people and they listen to other people, most kids, and then they don't like to listen to their parents. So it's yeah. kind of like yeah. the same thing as a manager. It's like, it's good to bring in someone to train because they have the outside and then your kids are going to like, oh my gosh, this new person, I'm going to listen to them. Yeah, <laughs> Whereas and, like and I, manager probably say the same thing the trainer does. But they don't listen. I was having that conversation with my wife. I said, you know, we send our we send our kids, we send students to schools so that they could come out and perform in real life. And it's the mm -hmm. same thing. Advisors have to be sent out for training so they could come out and perform in real life. The relationships that they build sells the second vehicle and forward. And mm -hmm. that is such an important retention tool to make sure that they have the skill set to be able to make the connections and retain our customers and our stores. Yeah, they do. Wait, so when you were a service manager, what was your, I guess, your favorite way to support your team besides training them or how did you achieve this? <laughs> the biggest thing was consistency. Um, I learned it very quickly. So every single Tuesday at 6.30 in the morning, everybody knew there was going to be training. The training was the consistency itself. That's yeah. what I started learning over time. The product itself, what the information that we brought was actually second level because what we were training our advisors to do was repeat and keep going, repeat it every Tuesday at 6.30. So if I, if I expected them there every Tuesday at 6.30, I expected them to do walk arounds as well every single time. So the information that we began training was just consistency. We came to a certain point where I started training the same curriculums and I'm making up numbers you know, step one through step 10. And then I didn't stop training that for three straight curriculums because I wanted to train with consistency. So to me, that's the biggest thing is to make sure you're consistent with training. If you send them off to training one time and you think you're done, that doesn't help them. You have to continue to, to bring in the training every time. Oh yeah. I get that. I mean, that's something I talk about a lot is like, especially with inventory control, it's like, you cannot set it and just let it, you have to constantly train and be aware of what's going on. But I did think of a question I wanted to ask you because now that you're on the other side and I don't know if it's the dark side, the light side, whatever we want to call it, <laughs> but you, you are on the vendor side now. <laughs> um, I love both sides. I will say I do love both sides. Good, but you probably won't go back. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm hoping to remain a trainer for the rest of my life. I said this was, to yeah. me, this is what I want to do for life. I want to train people. I want to help people. The reason for that is I was a very, very bad advisor. I was, and I consider myself the worst advisor at the beginning of my career. And I blamed it all on myself. It was all, all accountability on my own. But I was holding myself accountable without good training. I was holding myself accountable without the without being taught the proper way. Once I received yeah. the training and I was able to implement that, that's when I was able to turn it around. So when somebody gave me the opportunity and invested in me, I feel that I owe that back. So in my in my shoes, I say I owe this to every advisor that's out there. I have to go out there and train because there could be the next Eric sitting at the store who's a really bad advisor who requires just a different skill set. Yeah. And then look at you now, because I don't think you were a bad advisor. Well, you were a service manager, but I don't think you were bad when you left, <laughs> you know? I, you I hope I wasn't. <laughs> no, I don't think so at all. And that was going to be my question was, what is your favorite thing about your new role? And it sounds like it's the fact that you get to go help more advisors. Yes. It's understanding and listening. It's them talking to me and saying, here is what I need help with. I'm very direct when I walk into a service center and say, look, I was once a really bad advisor. This is what I was able to do. How can I help you? Um, yeah. I also like to, I like to marry that with the store's game plan. So how can I help this advisor help the store reach their goal? And, and taking the time, once, once I leave the training centers and you're, you go home or you go to the hotel room and you sit there at night, that time of focus of making sure the next day you go in and make a difference is one of my favorite times. Oh, that's really cool. And I, I figured that was going to be your answer because <laughs> that's just something, you know, some people just love helping people and the, and the training. And it's really cool that you found that, you know, in your, in your career path. So. 
Thank you. Yeah. And it sounds like, so every time I talk to a parts manager, they're like, you know, they've never really were trained. They just kind of were a really good counter person that became a parts manager. And it sounds like it's kind of the same in the service side of things too, is although there is a lot more training for service, typically that it's, there's no structure. Why, how can we change that for dealerships to have more structure and have just like training besides the manufacturer training, right? Cause there is manufactured training out there that you have. To I, do. I, I think that the best is good. It's, it's going to lead the, the best departments, the best stores, the best performers. Everybody is looking to be number one. Everybody's looking to be the best, no matter what store you go into, everybody's looking to improve. You have to, that top tier level is what has to improve because it's natural for you to look and study what number one is doing in order for you to get to that level and we have to make the number ones that much better the number ones will pull i do believe that there is structure and training that needs to be more in depth with advisors because our society is demanding it we have so many things at the touch of our fingertips now you can order food it comes to you you can order products and you'll have it the same day so we are now in service having to meet those expectations and those demands and people are having to understand people more and once once that once that culture and that brand sets in place I, and i believe right now training is needed in fixed operations more than ever mm -hmm. no you made a great point because i i go back to my subway days <laughs> and just working with people and the public I think it's probably the hardest, most stressful job. And for me, when I was doing it, I was just dealing with food. So that's really not that big of a deal. You, you know, service and parts, you're dealing with people's vehicles <laughs> that yeah. get them to work, that transport them wherever they need to go. So it's uh, the hardest, I think it's the hardest job in the world. <laughs> One of the hardest, I, I guess. I have a huge appreciation for it. On the fixed ops world, there's so much that has to go in play. I do believe the parts department plays a crucial role in our store. And I, and I, I've said it before, close the parts department, see what happens. It's that important to get, to order the parts, to get them there on time, to have the correct part. How many part numbers does a single glove box have? The color, the trim, the dashboard. There's so many things that go into play in, be, in being a parts person in order for you to be a top level parts department. And the same thing goes with service. The service department, as a service advisor, you have to know, or service manager, you have to know different types of people. You have to get along and understand different perspectives in order for you to be successful. I do think that when you put both departments in, there's, I'm not even getting into the technical side of things because technicians, my God, love them. The things they fix and how they fix them and the, the skill set that's carried to do it, they, they work in all sorts of conditions. It's admirable. So I, that's one of the reasons I love the fixed operations department. Oh yeah. And it all just comes together. Um, yes. I did have a yes. question I thought of, and it was going to be a good one. So my question was, what is your best horror story to share about your like customer experience and how did you overcome it? You have to have one, at least one, I feel like to share maybe. I do. It's actually, it's actually one of my best customers Oh, um, okay. today. It's, there was a rattle in the dashboard and we couldn't fix it it was a brand new vehicle custom ordered reached manufacturer level and long and behold it's a friday afternoon and i get the angry phone call and it's every name under the sun mm. and i remember just putting my head down and thinking this man just spent $100,000 on this vehicle. And we're talking 2004, 2005. Okay. And um, all I thought of was, I can't handle this over the phone. I have to go, I have to go in person. Mm -hmm. And it's the next state over, traffic hour, Friday afternoon. And I wasn't thinking, I wasn't thinking of going home. I, all I thought was I have to get to this person. So I hung up the phone. I jumped in my car and I drove to the person's house and I said, did you tell them that you were coming? I told them, I, I said, listen, I, I'm at work. There's nothing I can do here at home. And the only thing I could do is hear this when it's happening 
and the person said, why don't you get your beep, beep, beep here and listen for it yourself? And, <laughs> and I did. I, I, I went for it. <laughs> yeah. Couldn't believe that I went on a Friday. We test drove. We didn't end up hearing the noise. We what? drove for- But it was doing it when he called? 45 minutes. But the fact yeah. was that I cared and I went. I dropped everything I was doing. Yeah. Moving forward, every car they purchased, they had, I had to have a phone call. Uh, can you help me purchase my next car? I'm only going to purchase a car there. And taking the action out of me driving there, yeah, I showed that I cared. I showed they were the most important thing, that, that that rattle was just as important to me as it was to them. Um, yeah. And I was still, I mean, I'm talking 2004, 2005. I still was creating a solution for this customer at the end of 2022. So yeah. even till the end, and I, and I wasn't even working at that brand anymore, but it's still a phone call to me and say, can you help me out? That to me is, is one of the worst, best combinations I've had as a service advisor. Well, and I think that that happens a lot. Like the, no the noises that, that happen, sometimes they can't be reproduced and you have to show that you care so that you can help the person. <laughs> and it also shows that you built that connection too and not just retention. You just re retain that customer pretty much forever. Are they still gonna call you though to get cars? Probably, cause you're not, I mean, you're not there, but. <laughs> you know, it's, I love it. To me, it's not whether I'm, oh, I was still working for the same company, but it's not so much the brand. It's the fact that you made an impact in somebody's life that says, mm -hmm. every time I think of car, I think of, and I'm going to use my name, but every time, every time I think of car or car troubles, I think of Eric. Um, and yeah. that's the goal as, as either a store name or as an advisor, manager, technician, parts person that you want to reach every time that that person thinks they're in need think your name yeah. and that was a very impactful moment it was a, it was an overcoming part for me as an advisor to say that's what i'm not doing correctly mm -hmm. yeah wow that's a great story and i god i just think it happens all the time because i get to hear about it because i live with someone that has to do it so <laughs> it it's does. like so much about the noise <laughs> it yeah. does it, it, it happens more but those trophies that start to stack up as advisors start to make you do it more and more because you realize every time I do it, something good happens. Yeah, that's very true. Oh, that's it. I'm glad I asked that question because I just thought of it. I wasn't originally <laughs> going to ask you that, <laughs> but I'm like, oh, he's got to have a good story. <laughs> oh yeah. It's a, it's a, it's an awesome, I love that customer. <laughs> that's really cool. And he was really mean to, or he or she was really mean to you. And yeah, they, they were. Now it's literally every time we see each other, it's a handshake and a hug. Yeah, that's cool. So uh, just to wrap things up, I always like closing with a couple of fun questions. Is there a favorite, I guess, quote or mantra that you like to go by to keep you motivated? Because I feel like you're a super motivated, structured person, like, you know, just based on what we've talked about today. <laughs> Thank you. I do. I actually have it here on my wall and I'll, and I'll read it to cool. you. Um, I've missed over 9,000 shots in my career. I've lost over 300 games, 26 times I've been trusted to take the winning shot and I've missed, I failed over and over again. And that's why I succeed. It's a quote. I, I follow many people, but you know, Michael Jordan, Tom Brady, these are, these are people who have failed over and over and they never stop studying. They never stop practicing. Kobe Bryant is another one. They just, they focus so much on the detail and the training and what it takes to win that when it comes time to perform, it's natural. It's they're, they're prepared. So to me, being prepared is, is one of the biggest things that I focus on. Yeah. Well, and, and don't they say too, failing is not trying at all. So if you're, you're trying, you're not really failing because you're trying. <laughs> I, you know, if I fail, I'm going to fail big. And, that, and that's always been my thing. If I'm going to fail, that's because I, I lifted that expectation or that goal so high that it's unreachable. So I I don't mind failing big, but I better learn and I better give it a second shot. Um, exactly. So it's always for me, it's if I'm going to fail, I'm going to fail big. Yeah, that's a good way to think about it. And then what else? Did, oh, okay. I feel like I asked you and Joe this together. 
but I asked you guys to answer for each other. So I want to hear from you. What type of animal do you think you are and why? Because I think when Joe answered, he called you a chihuahua. <laughs> That's very true. Yeah, he tried correcting it with the octopus, but that was a uh, that was overseen by the chihuahua. <laughs> um. But the octopus, when he explained the octopus, I was like, okay, that totally, I could see that. But I want to know from like you, what do you think? And it could, you know, when I asked this question too, I'm like, it could be how you're feeling today, because I feel like, you know, one week you could be like a lion, the next week you could be a butterfly. I don't know. <laughs> Just how are you feeling? So, you know. If I had to pick an animal that I relate to, I would I would tell you there is two that I kind of look at and I try to really understand them. Uh, number one is a horse. Oh. I love horses. I have a passion for them. Um, I, I think they're brilliant. They're smart. And the fact that things that they can train to do, the, the withstand that they have, the endurance they have to take on different temperatures, weathers, climates, territories, yeah. I, I think is, is huge. Um, that is. Um, the second one is very specific, but it, it, it's a German Shepherd, and they're oh. very protective animals. They're very focused. They're brilliant. Same thing. I actually do. I, I shouldn't use the word studies, but like everybody else, I go online and I read about them, um, and I yeah. do study them to see how they do things because they use different senses and. Again, and being in the fixed operations department, you don't realize the senses that you have. You hear that door go up and your body naturally will grab a clipboard, a pen, an like iPad and walk right out to the drive. Those are senses that we have to have. You hear, you hear a different noise in the store that you don't normally hear. You're going to go out and look. So yeah. I use those different senses and I love the way those, those two animals are so trainable. And I always try to make sure that I remain trainable and I'm able to grow every day. Oh, those are good answers. And I, you know, th your description about a horse, you know, I, I never would have thought, I love horses, but I never would have thought about, you know, the way you describe that. So I could, I could totally see that. And I have an appreciation for service advisors or just anyone in fixed ops that can just hear certain noises in vehicles and just be like, oh, I think it's that, yeah. <laughs> you know, and like, yeah. right. <laughs> You can hear a car coming in with a particular problem and you already have an idea of what's happening. The, yep. the skill set that they build is so respectable. You can see a customer walking in the door. We don't have a computer to diagnose it, nor do we have anything to say, here's what it is. But you can sense a person coming in if they're upset, they're happy, yeah. what their emotions are at. And that connection to me is so important. So I have huge oh, yeah. respect for what everybody does. Totally. I just, I think back to like, okay, so my dad was a carpenter and we would drive around and he'd be like, I built that or I helped, you know, work on that stuff. But, but now I'm with someone who's in fixed ops and he'll hear a car who's like exhaust leak that, that, that doesn't sound right. Or he'll just say, <laughs> yes. It's just so awesome. I love Guilty. It. <laughs> I've done that. Guilty. I've done it a lot. But now I'm finding myself do it too. Cause I'm like, Oh, I remember that noise that he pointed out and it sounds like an exhaust leak or it, it, rotors. That sounds horrible. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I love the fact that we can do that. I really do. It's like a superpower. It really is. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> That's the superpower that service advisors and, and even parts people have too. It's just pretty amazing. The, the numbers they can remember are I worked, with, I worked with a parts person in 2000, oh early 2000s. I'll leave it at that. And you yeah. can walk up and ask the person for a seatbelt cover on a specific year, color, and he, he could just rattle it off and punch it in without looking it up. Mm -hmm. That's talent. That, remembering that, is that it, that's so much talent. And, and the efficiency behind keeping people moving and getting them the right parts, there's no price on that. Yeah. Gosh. Such an amazing, just the operation as a whole. It's just amazing. So I'm so glad you came on the show. This was very impactful. And I think a lot of people are going to get a lot from this. How can they reach you if they want to reach out to you? What's the best way? Uh, the best way you can reach me, you can reach me via phone, LinkedIn, text message, email, um, which uh, hopefully you'll have them up on, on the links. Please uh -huh. feel free. There are so many ways to contact me, but feel free. Uh, I, I respond and we're on our phones all day long, making sure uh, people get responded to. 
but you know, more than happy to to come out and train and help any facility that's, that's in need. Very good. Well, I'm sure you'll get some phone calls, hopefully. And uh, thanks for coming on the show. Thank you, Kaylee. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Parts Edge, the power tool for your parts department. We hope you're leaving feeling motivated, challenged, and inspired 